The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, transcribed and presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. When you opened the mailbox this morning, did you receive a postcard from a representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society? This postcard I'm talking about was mailed to thousands of people by Equitable Society representatives yesterday, inviting everyone to listen to a brief but very important message in tonight's middle commercial. It will give you interesting details about the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan, a practical, workable plan for people who want to be independent after they reach the age of 60. I'll be back in approximately 14 minutes to give you full information on this special plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Merchant of Death. From time to time, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has reported the latest figures on the current crime wave to you through the medium of this, their official program. Now it is time to report on one facet of the latest survey, one fact which stands out like a beacon above all others. There is a person murdered in the United States every 40 minutes, day and night, throughout the year. These are shocking figures. But even if they fail to impress you in any way, your FBI asks you not to ignore their potential danger. The killing of that many people, more people than died in many of the big battles of World War II, is something that requires every citizen's attention, if only out of the selfish motive of self-preservation. The victims in some portion of the more than 13,000 murders which took place last year were criminals who happened to be killed by other criminals. Their loss to the community was negligible in most cases, and a boon in a few others. But the great majority of victims were decent, law-abiding people who merely happened by accident of fate to cross the path of a murderer, and who, because of that accident, were killed. Tonight's file opens in the attractively furnished private office of John Williams a real estate broker in a large eastern city. A visitor, one Mr. Homer Cooper, has just been shown in. Well, have a chair, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, think nothing of it. I'm a patient man, Mr. Williams. <laughs> well, that's good. Now, uh, uh, what particular kind of property were you interested in seeing? Oh, I'm afraid there's been some mistake. I didn't come here to talk to you about real estate. Oh, when I told your secretary this was a business matter, I, uh, I meant my business. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what is your business? That, uh, that's a difficult question to answer, Mr. Williams. You, uh, you might say I was kind of, uh, commission broker. Commission broker? Yes, yes. I, uh, handle all types of, uh, oh, uh, unusual services. Uh, for instance, if you wanted to get a passport and you found you couldn't get it legitimately... Then you might come to me. You understand? Yes. Yes, I think I do. And I I don't know what brought you here, Mr. Cooper, but I haven't any need for your services. Uh, let me finish. I came to see you about a commission I've just received. It uh, concerns you. How? Someone has requested that I use my offices to have you killed. Mr. Cooper, I don't like practical jokes. Oh, I assure you I've never been more serious. This party came to me and said he'd pay me $2,000 if I'd hire someone to murder you. Oh, and incidentally, my client says no guns. This is supposed to look like a hit-and-run accident. <clears throat> Mr. Cooper, 
If all this is true, and understand I'm not saying I believe a word of it, why are you telling me? This is my business, Mr. Williams. You see, I thought it might be worth more than $2,000 to a man like you to stay alive. Oh, well, now I get it. A very clever racket. Oh, this is not a racket, Mr. Williams. Please believe me. Everything I told you is true. But why... Now, look, sir. You don't have to make any hasty decisions. We have time. Why don't you just think this whole matter over, and when you come to a decision, let me know. And if I don't? Then, sir, much as I regret it, I will be forced to go ahead with the original plan. You mean... Here is my card, Mr. Williams. You'll find my business address and telephone number on it. The price for your remaining alive, sir, is $5,000. For that sum, I'll reveal the name of the client who wishes you killed. If you wish to pay it, just come up to my office with the cash. Otherwise? Well, then, sir, I'll always remember you as the man who wouldn't pay $5,000 for staying alive. <laughs> John. Yes, Anne? What's the matter, darling? Oh, nothing. Tossed and turned ever since we went to bed. Yes, I... I, I, I just can't fall asleep. Something's bothering you. Come on, John, what is it? Well, a man came to see me today. A man named Cooper. And? He told me he'd been hired to... Well, to get someone to kill me. John, I don't believe it. I didn't at first. Why, the whole thing is preposterous. I know. It's so preposterous, Anne, that... Well, I... I, I just can't help thinking it might be true. Oh, darling. I, I can't help thinking that, Anne. Who would want to kill you? I don't know. But... This Cooper said he'd reveal the name of the man for $5,000. John, he's just trying to get money out of you. I accused him of that, but he swore that his facts were true. I don't believe him. But, Anne... John, look, darling, try to get some sleep now. We'll discuss it again tomorrow. Well, all right. I just hope tomorrow isn't too late. Rhythm, please. The rhythm, please. Mr. Harper, the samba, the rhythm dance. Ralph. Uh, oh, hello, Anne. Can I see you a minute? Oh, surely. Uh, pardon me. Uh, you just go on without me. I'll be right back. What is it, Anne? Let's go to your office. Well, I can't just walk out on the class. Ralph, this is important. All right. Come on. I'll be back. Now, Anne, what is it? John knows about Cooper. What? Cooper went to see him at his office. Said that for $5,000, he'd agree to tell him who hired him. Boy, that dirty chiseler. Ralph, just how much did you tell Cooper? About what? About us. Absolutely nothing. Why didn't Cooper come to you if he wanted more money? I don't know. Let's offer him 6000 Go to John and ask for eight. Oh, that's true. I've racked my brain. I can't think of anything. Does John want to pay him? Wants to go to the police. No, well, that's just as bad. I convinced him to sleep on it another night. What'll we do, Ralph? You go on home, darling. I'll think of something. The next morning, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Paul Mason. Hello, Paul. Hi, Jim. There's a switch in signals. No? I don't have to go to court. Fine, fine. As soon as you finish your report on that case, then we can go to work on this new one. How much have we got so far? Well, the body of a rather well-dressed middle-aged man was found on a government reservation where it now appears that he was murdered. Who was he? We don't know that yet. We're checking on the labels in his clothes. I don't think we'll have much trouble learning his identity. 
Any word in the report on how he was killed? Well, he was sapped with some heavy weapon on the back of the head and his body left on the highway. Hmm, that wouldn't seem to be a very good place to conceal a body. Well, apparently this was supposed to look like a hit-and-run accident. Oh. There were skid marks on the road, and the body was very carefully placed right beside them. Do we know for sure that it wasn't a hit-and-run accident? Well, the victim's clothes didn't have a spot on them, Paul. If he'd been struck by a car that was going fast enough to leave skid marks, he'd have ripped something when he hit the pavement. Yeah, I guess he would have. Besides which, there was no identity in his pockets. Oh, I'm going out now to check on some of the labels that were found on the dead man's clothes. Right, Jim. As soon as we find out who he was, we'll go into action. Anne. Darling, I thought you went to the office. Well, I stopped off to see that Mr. Cooper. Why? I decided to pay him and find out what he knew. What did he say? He wasn't there. He's been murdered. What? He was murdered last night. How do you know? Well, there was a man from the FBI at his office. He told me all about it. He questioned me for quite a while about who Mr. Cooper was, how I met him, what I was doing at his office, or a lot of things. Well, what did you tell him? Well, I... I lied. I told him I'd received a telephone call from Mr. Cooper yesterday to come and see him about a real estate transaction. I told him I'd never seen Mr. Cooper, that I didn't know anything about him. Did he believe you? I don't know. What else went on? Nothing, except they're searching for the killer. They know who it is? He didn't say. Oh. And I... I've decided to go back to see him. The FBI man? Yes. What for? I was wrong. I, I, I shouldn't have lied to him. I'm going to tell him what I know. John, that wouldn't serve any purpose. But I want to... This be... is a murder case. The tabloids will be filled with every detail. Do you want to be mixed up in that? But I must do something. Darling, go inside and lie down. Think the whole thing out very carefully. And I'm sure you'll decide then that the best thing to do is forget the whole thing. <laughs> Hold it, hold it. Now, will someone please take that record off? Thank you. I'm afraid you're just not watching me. Now, look. One and two. One and two. One and two. One and two. Da-da-da-da. da 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 Now, that's simple, isn't it? All right, start the record again. Ralph, I've got to see you. Oh. Can you excuse yourself? Uh, yeah. Pardon me, I'll be right back. Come on. This is really serious. Let's wait until we get into the office, huh? Go ahead. Thanks. What is it? John just came home. He's been to Cooper's office. So? There was an FBI man there. He told John that Cooper was murdered. Oh. Ralph, did you kill him? Yes. Oh, how did it happen? Well, I called him yesterday morning after you left here and asked him if he'd take a ride with me. Yes. He agreed and we went out to the country. I started to question him about the double cross. What did he say? I got mad and threw a punch at me. There was a tire wrench on the floor of your car, and I picked it up and hit him with it. My car? You used my car? Yes. Oh, Ralph. Well, it's back in your garage now. Nobody knows I took it. We have no assurance of that. And look, how much did John tell you about uh, what went on between him and the man from the FBI? Why? Well, do you know whether or not the FBI man asked John if he knew Cooper? Yes, he did. What did he say? He said he never met him. That's fine. Why? All you have to do is tell one small lie. What are you talking about? If the police should learn from some anonymous source that John was driving your car last night, they'll question you. And you want me to say he was? You say he was out all night. What good does that do? Darling, it hangs Mr. Cooper's murder right around John's neck. We'll return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now, here's an invitation to all members of this audience. 
an invitation to join a group of American citizens who have taken advantage of the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. If you've ever been worried by the thought, what's going to become of me when I'm 60 years old, this plan is the answer. It provides for financial independence when it's time for you to retire. It enables you to be your own boss, to live as you like and where you like. I retired to the little old town where I was born and raised. Believe me, my wife and I have a mighty good life now. I'll bet you do. Mr. Keating, our food bills amount to practically nothing. Eggs from our own chickens, fruit from our own little orchard, and believe me, I have one of the best vegetable gardens in town. Whenever I hear a man talk like that, I say to myself, why doesn't everybody in America have an equitable independent 60s plan? They make the same mistake I made for years. They think an independent 60s plan is a proposition only a rich man can afford. How did you find out different? From my equitable society representative. He showed me that I was already halfway towards the independent 60s, thanks to Social Security and the life insurance I already owned. That's a fact. In many cases, only a small amount of additional insurance is required to enable a man to look forward with complete confidence to independent 60s. A few extra dollars a week did it for me. So why not see your equitable representative without delay? Phone him soon. Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Merchant of Death. The Roman Empire, which existed from the year 27 B.C. when it was established by Augustus Caesar until the year 395 A.D., was the home of a civilization which reached heights the world had never before known. It contributed military leaders, artists, and statesmen to the pages of history. Men who will be remembered as long as people study the lives of those who went before them. We know a great deal about these people who flourished almost 2,000 years ago. We know how they dressed, and how they spoke, and what the common axioms of their language were. We know, too, that even then, the criminal among them was a cause of concern and that through the years he has not changed his habits very much. That can be said because one of the axioms that has come down to us through the corridors of time from those ancient Romans is as true today as it was then. A proverb which applies to tonight's case from the files of your FBI and which said, Who is content with one crime only? The answer is that no criminal is content with a single misdeed. Not even when, as in the case portrayed this evening, that crime is murder. Tonight's file continues later the same day. Special Agent Taylor is just signing out at the FBI field office as Agent Paul Mason enters. Jim, you going out on that murder case? Yeah, yeah, Paul. We found out who the dead man was. Oh, who? A man named Homer Cooper. He was first arrested about 25 years ago. After I learned his identity, I went over to his office in the bulletin building. Any leads there? A lot of correspondence. I, I haven't read it yet. And there's an old dictograph machine in the inner office, but no records any place to be found. Have we got Cooper's home address? Not yet, but we may not need it, Paul. While I was searching Cooper's office, a man named John Williams came in looking for him. He seemed to be legitimate. I questioned him for a while. He said he'd never seen Cooper, so I let him go. Uh-huh. But then I checked at Williams' office just to make sure... His secretary said that Cooper was in there two days ago and spent quite some time closeted with her boss. I wonder why he lied. I think I have the answer. We got an anonymous phone call a few minutes ago. The person who called said that he didn't want to become involved in the case. But he said if we checked closely enough, we would find that John Williams was being blackmailed by Cooper. That would certainly give him a motive. Yeah. Well, I'm going out now and pick up John Williams for questioning. <laughs> Just a minute. Hello, Ann. Well, I've got some good news. The FBI picked John up for questioning. I knew they would. 
How? I told them about him. What? Yeah. I called them and said that Cooper was blackmailing John. Oh. I didn't give my name, of course. <laughs> How about a drink? Yes. Scotch? Mm-hmm. They took my car. Yeah, I figured they would. Why? Well, I told him I saw John riding in your car with Cooper last night. Oh. There you are, darling. Let's drink a toast to John. May he stay in jail, and may we stay out. <laughs> This Cooper case is really breaking open. What happened? The lab just got finished examining Williams's car. Oh, what's the dope? The tires match the tracks that were found at the spot on the highway where Cooper's body was discovered. There are stains on the upholstery that turn out to be human blood, Cooper's type. I'd say we had just about enough, Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, what's Williams' story? He says he was home all last night. Hmm, well, that ought to be easy enough to check. Well, I've got the switchboard trying to locate Mrs. Williams now. They tried her at home, but she was out. Oh, by the way... Uh, those dictograph records of Cooper's were found in a safe deposit box are being sent up here now. Good. We ought to... No, I'll get it for him. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, yes, Mrs. Williams. Yes, I, I just wanted to ask you one question, if you don't mind. Mrs. Williams, where was your husband last night? I see. You're sure now? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Williams. Goodbye. What'd she say? She really hung it on him, Paul. Said she's sure that her husband wasn't home all night. Well, that just about does it. I'm not so sure. Hmm? Something happened during that phone call that makes me think Williams might not be guilty. Consider the deal to be closed. Good. And as soon as the job's done, you'll get your money. Sorry you've had to listen to all these records by yourself, Jim. Did you find anything? Yeah. What? This record on the machine now exonerates Williams. How? It's a conversation between Cooper and someone else. And Cooper is being hired to get someone to kill Williams. Then your theory about Williams' innocence was right. Yeah, but it was more than a theory, Paul. While I was talking with his wife, I heard a very unusual set of chimes start ringing. So? So I heard the same set of chimes a couple of hours earlier. Where? They were in the background when that anonymous phone call came in telling us that Cooper was blackmailing Williams. Oh. The switchboard is trying to locate the address that goes with the number where they found Mrs. Williams now. I see. Now, about this record, Jim, uh, can you recognize the other voice? No, no, I can't. Quality just isn't good enough. This is pretty obsolete equipment Cooper was using. Well, that's too bad. Well, let's listen to it again. Paul, see if you can catch anything. I've done this so many times, now I'm kind of numb. I'll try. Okay, I'll start it here in the middle. The first half isn't very much. Oh, well, one other thing, Mr. Cooper. Yes? What's that? It must look as if Williams died in a hit-and-run accident. I understand your position perfectly. You may rely implicitly on my discretion. Now, I don't want this job too messy in any way, you understand? I understand. <laughs> Pardon me, I just can't help yawning getting to be past my bedtime. Well, if you'll call me again, say, day after tomorrow, I'll arrange for you to meet the young man I have in mind for the job. He's a nice youngster, and he's got just the right temperament. Hey, Paul, Paul, him. that's it! Oh, how did I miss it all those other times? Miss what, Jim? He said it was getting to be past his bedtime. Come on, let's check on something. <laughs> In your living room. I've just been admiring your taste. Ralph, These drapes Ralph, you've are beautiful. Get out of here. What for? John's coming up the walk. But he's in jail. Well, he managed to get out somehow. Please, darling, you've got to. I'm afraid it's too late. What do we do? Let me handle this. Anne. Tell him you're in here. I'm in here, darling. Oh. I thought for a moment that you. Who is this? Uh, I'm a reporter with a bulletin, Mr. Williams. I came by to ask your wife some questions. Oh. Uh, but uh, now that you're back... Uh, just a minute. Uh, huh? Don't go. But... Uh... Don't you want to ask me some questions? Don't you want to know how I happen to be picked up for questioning? 
Well, uh... I'll give you some very good items for a story. For instance, my wife here told the FBI that I was out all last night, and that wasn't true. Why did you tell them that, Anne? I didn't, John. Yes, you did. Why, they must have misunderstood me. I said you were ill and up all night, not out. Then how does it happen that there was blood on the front seat of your car? Wouldn't you like to know about that, Mr... Uh, uh, Brown. Wouldn't that interest you, Mr. Brown? John, I won't stand here and be questioned by you in front of a perfect stranger. Uh, you'll pardon me, Mr. Williams. <laughs> this looks like a family fight to me, and our paper isn't interested in that sort of thing. I must leave. John, dear, you don't believe that I deliberately tried to get you in trouble, do you? Anne, I... I don't know what to believe. But why should I? It hasn't been a day since we were married that I haven't been in love with you, John. And you with me. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams, may I come in? Why, yes, Mr. Taylor. Come right ahead. Thank you. Ralph. Anne, I've been arrested. What's this all about? This man is the one who hired Mr. Cooper. He also killed him. Ralph, they can't prove that, can they? I'm afraid we can, Mrs. Williams. I've got warrants here for the arrest of both of you on a charge of murder. Ralph Brown was found guilty of murder in federal court and sentenced to be executed. Mrs. Williams was also judged guilty and sentenced to five years as accessory to the crime. When Special Agent Taylor heard Mr. Cooper's voice on the recording say that it was past his bedtime, he realized that he could learn the identity of Cooper's visitor. Checking the records kept in Mr. Cooper's office building of all visitors after 6 p.m., he learned that the man he was searching for was named Ralph Brown. When he later learned that the number from which the anonymous phone call had been made was listed in the name of Ralph Brown, things began to gel. The information that Mrs. Williams was a constant visitor of Brown's plus the fact that a search of his apartment led to the finding of the tire wrench, which had been used as a murder weapon, was conclusive enough to bring forth confessions from both. And so, another crime was solved by your FBI, and the solution added further proof that the phrase getting away with murder is just a phrase and nothing more. Under the alert eyes of the law, the truth of another phrase has been demonstrated time and time again. The truth of the simple words, murder will out. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, two final questions on the Equitable Society's Independent 60s plan. Well, Mr. Keating, now what's the best age to start one of these plans? Any age. Your Equitable representative will explain that the sooner you start, the less your plan will cost you each year. Well, what about the income? How much can I expect when I'm 60? The exact amount depends on two factors, your present income and your future needs. In any event, your Equitable Society representative will be glad to work it out for you without obligation. Phone him soon, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a story depicting the short-lived careers of two vicious young criminals. Its subject, robbery. Its title, Three's a Crime. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's program was transcribed, and the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Jack Edwards, Bill Johnstone, Lynn Whitney, Roland Winters, and Donald Wood. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Three's a crime on This Is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.